criminal history should certainly be taken into consideration. I am sick thinking that he could be released in the next few months and have had many sleepless nights since being notified of this hearing. <clears throat> Alan apparently has done well while in prison, but that is only because he is in a lawful, controlled and locked environment. Alan does not know how to treat women and there will be another victim down the road. Sir, I, I apologize, Mrs. Mrs. Williams. Sir, you, please don't do that. That's very I, disrespectful. Please. Listen, that's disrespectful. I, listen. And that is just a small glimpse into the really insanity of this parole hearing by this giant baby, which is really what he is. We're about to watch another Connecticut wacky parole hearing, disturbing parole hearing, and I'll unpack it with all the details at the end. Please state your name and inmate number for the record. Alan Trivity, 156001. This hearing is being conducted in consideration of the parole application for Alan Trivity, 156001. He is serving a sentence of four years followed by six years special parole for violation of a protective order and engaging police in pursuit. As of today, records reflect the parole eligibility date of August 7, 2024. There is victim input in this case. There is an offender accountability plan for the offender. It has been reviewed and shows he has completed domestic violence and he works as a janitor. Utilizing the statewide collaborative, excuse me, utilizing the statewide collaborative offender risk evaluation system, the offender's overall score falls within a very high range of risk for recidivism. Mr. Trivide, this is your opportunity to express to the board why you believe you should be granted parole. You may begin. I would just like to continue my life the way it was. I changed my life in 2012 after my son died. And I don't know, I just, I just, just really, I don't know what to say. I, there's nothing more I can do to better myself. I okay. wanted to leave this person and move back mm -hmm. to my place in Bristol. And this is, I don't know, this is what happens. I don't, Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Trivide, for your opening statement. What's going to happen here today is we're going to take an opportunity to ask you some questions. And then when we're done with our questions, we'll turn the hearing over to our victim's advocate, Ms. Williams, and then we'll deliberate and uh, we will give you our decision. I'm just going to ask you to just remember once we get to the part where the victim um, is sharing their statement, we ask that you please not interrupt, okay? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Mr. Trivide, Trivide, right? It's Trivide? Yes. Okay, because he said D. Um, you, you have an extensive criminal history that dates back to 1986, and most of it is um, domestic violence uh, related convictions. Can you explain to us uh, what you've learned in the domestic violence program about inter intimate partner uh, relationships? Um, I grew up in a very dysfunctional life. Uh, I drank, which was a big problem I had, which caused a lot of these arrests. Mm -hmm. And in 2012, I stopped drinking and changed my life. Uh, I took domestic violence classes, learned a lot. What did you I learn? That's, that, that was the question. What did you learn? Well, you can't control anybody. You know, if, if there's red flags, you need to leave the situation. Um, you're not going to control anybody. You're not going to change anybody. Uh, it's just... If it's not right, you need to just leave. It's just, right. just because so, you can't change anything. Absolutely. Well, you 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 can once you're level headed. I think you know you just walk away, right. cool off. Right. Exactly. You go right. to your corners and you know come back and then have that discussion. Um, however, in your um, case with this victim, 
um, you know, you continued contacting her on the phone. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, you saw her at the stop and shop and then you called her and, you know, um, so you weren't physically in her presence uh, when you were making those telephone calls to her. So how did, how does that apply? Like th to what you've learned, apply what you've learned to that situation. That I take a hundred percent responsibility for her because I should have just, well, somehow got an attorney, but. An like attorney said, for what? Like I told you, when I went to work, all the accounts were drained. The locks were changed on the house we owned together. And I was like, my head was spinning. Mm -hmm. And then I went home, I grabbed some clothes and I left. And then I called, I says, I need some more clothes and a spare key to my truck. Please leave it at the mailbox, huh? And there was nothing, there was no restraining orders, nothing. So she put the key out there, but no clothes. And I, I, had, I only grabbed a couple clothes. I was like running around. My apartment in Bristol was destroyed from the person I rented it to. I mean, I have severe depression and, and so, so, just so, things. So, Mr. Trivity. But it, uh, that went both ways. I mean, she was contacting me. I was contacting her. Mr. Trivity. Mr. Trivity. Um, yes. When there is a protective order in place, what does that mean? That means to not contact the person or go around them. Exactly. And so this is not your first time um, experiencing violate, uh, protective orders being in place or restraining orders being in place. This is something that has happened over the years. The last one that I, the first one that I see actually dates back to 1994, where you had a protective order in place and you violated. Yes. yes. So when, I'm not understanding I... what it, what, what is it that you need to do to stay away from these women once they say they don't want to be involved with you tomorrow? See, I, I, this is hard to explain because I, I, I wanted to leave. Uh, we're not talking about this victim. We're talking about your behavior in, the, in, in general. In the, past, in the past, that's why I stopped drinking. I, my alcohol caused a lot of problems in my life. 2012. Okay. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you there. I understand that alcohol played a role, but it looks as if, according to my records, that you dropped the alcohol and picked up the crack. Did you think no. your behavior was going to change no, with no. a different substance? No, I, 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 I was doing very well in life. I had two operations the winter. This the winter this all took place. We, we were doing very well. I just didn't want to live in Torrington because of my history there. I lived in Bristol for five years. I did phenomenal. I stayed away from Torrington. I when was the last away. time you did crack? When I jumped off the wall. And when was that? Uh, uh, September, I think, I don't know, September. September of what? Year? I was so depressed. I was so depressed. I was suicidal. I jumped off. September water. of what, Mr. Trivity? I, I, we ask very specific questions, and and many of them are sometimes yes or no, and and other times we ask questions because we really are genuinely um, concerned about honing in on uh, your responses with regard to change in behaviors, change in the way that you're thinking. So I understand that you want to try to explain yourself, but we've read your file. That's one of the things that we're that we're statutorily required to do. So we understand right. your upbringing. We know the relationship and the dynamics between you and this lady who's your current right. victim. But I'm specifically asking you about your substance abuse. When was the last time that you used crack cocaine? September when? Whatever day it was, I jumped off the wall. I don't know what day it was. It was, it was I didn't September. say the year. The, what, I mean, so, I didn't say the day, the year. September oh, what? Gee, when did I come in here? 21, 22, 22? So you, that was, that was 
less than a, that was all a little over a year ago. So you were using crack at the time that you were committing these offenses, is what I was trying no, to get. No, at. I wasn't. I, I, I wasn't a crack. I'm not a crackhead. Who's, I now, was who's in that? A, that? Well, no, I, I, I don't know what's going on here. Yes, I, I, I was severely son. depressed. I had operations. I was taking pain pills. I was getting suicide. I, 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 I feel like I'm being, I don't know. I, what, I'm asking, you said that you've been free from alcohol, sir. Yes. Since 2012. Yes. And I said, I made the statement. It looks as if you put the alcohol down and picked up the cocaine and the crack habit. No, no, absolutely and you not. you said you didn't. So no. I went on to say, when was the last time that I you used it? I used it once the day I jumped off the wall. I wanted to and kill myself. That was in September of 2022. Yes. So yes. if that was the case, then that means that when you were committing these offenses, in 2022, against this victim, you were using drugs. No, I did that the day I jumped off the wall. So you only did it one time. The way the day I wanted to kill myself. I'm, I, I, you only used. Yes, I'm, I'm telling you, I did it the day I jumped off the wall. So I you to kill only myself. used it one time. Yes. So why do, does your file read as though you struggled with substance abuse for a number of years? I'm, I'm alcohol. I'm, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. But you just said you stopped using alcohol in 2012. And then yes. you gradually started using cocaine. No, I never said I gradually used... started using. No, I never said I gradually started using cocaine. So go ahead. Wait, so in August 2022, you had an assessment at the Bristol Hospital. And one of the questions, your response to one of their questions was, and this is in quotes, cocaine use at least three times a week with your last use being one gram last night. So when I read that statement, I have to agree with the chair that it appears that you were using crack cocaine three times a week, at least during this, at least prior to this August 2022 assessment. I went there and told them all kinds of stuff. I became suicidal over this whole situation. Sir, Mr. Trivedi, I'm going to ask you to refrain from discussing your personal health ailments only because this this video is being live streamed to the whole okay. world. So whoever wants okay. to look at it or look it up, just your per we want to protect your privacy to some degree. Well, so there's, there's nothing, I have nothing to hide. Well, okay, that's, that's your choice. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, so back to my line of questioning, it, it sounds as if um, you, your mouth is saying that you've accepted full responsibility, but um, you're, you're, you, in this next breath, you're minimizing um, the role that you played in this, these offenses. No, I, no, I, I, I wanted to leave a situation I wasn't happy in. I, 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 I don't. No, Mr. Tr but that does not negate your contact in the vision. It says you called her like 11 times. I mean, you showed up at she the house me, screaming she, she and called, yelling at her. She called not me today. Sir, the, sir, sir. Uh, not, not, only, not only did you try to get into her house, you were outside screaming absurdities okay. in front of the house for her to let you in and she had to contact the police. Not only that, sir, um, you know, you, you've had a history of these kinds of behaviors. And I want to, to suggest that you find um, a therapist or someone to speak with regarding your underlying issues, because there's something going on that you have not yet addressed that's causing you to behave in this manner. And until you get to the bottom of that, you're going to continue to find yourself in situations where your intimate partner relationships are Violent, you know, are, are toxic. I'm going to say that. You even told the, the parole officer that this lady said, if you can't have, if she can't have you, nobody can. Is that, was that, did I read that right? She can't have me? 
Yeah. Yeah, she told me that when we first bought our house. Wow. If I can't be with you, I'd rather be dead. I, 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 I changed my life, and I never in my life thought I'd get put in jail for wanting to leave somebody. Well, it wasn't because you didn't you wanted to leave, sir. When I day, you violated the protective order. The day I met her at the store, she had called me. We she was calling me, wanting to see me. Okay, and well, I was, you should have contacted the police. Yes. I made period. the biggest there, mistake of my life by contact uh, by by going to see her, hoping I could get some of my that, money in my property. Wasn't the, Sir, you, you contacted her that day. You contacted her in June. The protective order was already in place. You contacted her in August. You weren't, you knew the protective order was in place. You had a bunch of charges that were knowledge, sir. That does not negate the payment. Ben contacting this victim. So you can't say that you didn't, you never would have thought that you would have been in prison when you violate a protective order. That's a serious serious thing because many people in this victims like this victim in this in your case they lose their lives because people violate the protective orders so here in this state we take that very seriously we we absolutely do and you it looks like you violated one two three four five six seven eight nine uh restraining orders or protective orders you violated them so you have to figure it out, sir. And I can go down the list. I have all of your entire criminal history goes there. So I figured um, it out. Yeah. But I you know, very, I, I, I was doing very well before her and I talked in depth about how we wanted to live our lives. Yeah. We weren't gonna buy a big house, we weren't gonna yeah. live in Torrance. We did yeah. every and what did we do? We got a big house in Torrance. I wasn't happy. I wanted to move back to my house in Bristol. This happened, yes. I take full responsibility for meeting her at Stop it's and not, Shop. And it, that's, it, there's no, nothing else no, I could do. No, but you, you, it's not just the Stop and Shop. So you're not listening. Right. Okay, so Mr. Tividate, I, I really don't have any other questions for you. I have to be honest with you and tell you that I really see don't see any evidence of change. I'm glad that you did complete the domestic violence program. And um, I, you will definitely have to do it when you're out on special parole as well. So I really do hope that you don't find yourself in this situation again. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, you Thank have any questions? Sure. Thank you. So Mr. Trivity, right? Yes, yeah, Trivity, yeah, so, Trivity. Trivity, Mr. Trivity. So our challenge is that, you know, we need to figure out whether you're suitable for release or not, right? Yes. So what we need to hear, basically hear from you is what changes have you made to give us the the comfort of being able to to do that, and and what's happening today is that we're not hearing that. You know, I, so, well, to be so, honest with you, to be honest with you, I came here expecting not to even get this, with everything that's happened in court and what's going on. I'm just trying to live a normal life. I lost my son the last time I was locked up. He died. That changed my life drastically. I just lost my nephew a couple weeks ago, and it's just it, nothing I do is good enough for anybody. Just I I I stay out of Torrington because that's where I grew up, and a lot of bad things happened. I got out in 2016. I did phenomenal. That's why my childhood sweetheart got involved with me because I was doing great. I changed my life. I did a complete 180. And but then you I got was involved, not, I then wasn't you got involved happy. in this. Then you got involved in this. Or that she's my childhood sweetheart. We got we we got together and because I was doing phenomenal. And we bought a house together. I wasn't happy living I got all that. I got all that earlier. You don't have to, you to go back through that again. Right. But uh, but I have a good job. But, I'm but trying hear, me to, out. hear me out for a second, please. You, we want we want to be able to hear what changes you've made. You've taken this domestic violence. You should be talking about what skills you've learned, what what how you've changed in your attitude, how you're gonna you know you had 13 unsuccessful releases with this. I mean, those are the things that we have to consider, right? And we're not really hearing that from you at this point. 
So, in fact, I agree with my, with my with chairperson. You know, a lot of minimization and a lot of other things. You know, more like you're the victim than anybody else. No, no, no. no I'm, not, I, I'm saying, I'm I, saying that's what we're hearing. That's yeah. what we're hearing. So, so you know, I take full responsibility. You, you haven't taken all of your programming yet either. I take all. I take full responsibility for my actions. That's what changed my life. When I was in jail in 2012, I took full responsibility. Nobody ever put I. Nobody ever put me in jail. I put myself in jail. Well, that's good to hear that you you, you acknowledge that. And as far as the restraining orders, I I I I can't change that. I went and met her. She we she wanted to talk. I wanted to talk, and I went and met her like a dummy. And I wish I never did. I I I can't change that. The problem I, the problem is that it's not the first time that that's happened with you. That's one of, that's one of the issues with us. But that's not the first time. It's a decision that you made more other, more than just this time. So, you know, you, you're not paying attention to, you know, taking responsibility for the fact that you have a protective order. You're not supposed to be seeing the person. It's your responsibility to say, hey, look, no, I can't do this. I'm sorry. You know, you look, you look you're, where you're at. Look where you ended up. You're absolutely right. I, 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 there's, there's, and you didn't I, do that. You didn't do that. And that concerns us. You didn't do it just once. You've done it several times more you know more than once and that's what concerns us that you haven't got to that point where you figured that out yet and here's where you are so so, well, so i mean i don't really have a lot of other questions but i think the chairperson asked a lot of questions but i think we need, you know i think you still need some more programming and I, I, I'm, I'm not there today but um but i do wish you a lot of luck and i hope that you can get yourself together yeah i know i i <laughs> all right with what's going on with this family, I don't see that happening. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, All right. I'm sure I'm done. Thank you. This one. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Trevor, I remember I told you about the victim's piece um, and that, that you needed to be quiet. Well, now's that time. So we're going to turn the hearing over to our victim's advocate, Mrs. Williams. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, panel. I do have a statement for the board. One moment. To whom this may concern? Poor, pig, worthless, and inconvenient, chunky. You will never find a man to love you. You're crazy. You're too sensitive. You need help. This is all your fault. These are only a few examples of the horrible things that Alan said to me. No, it wasn't always like this, but once he came off of probation and had complete freedom, he began slipping back into his old ways and slowly started using again. Pills of all kinds, cocaine, alcohol, and before I knew it, he was disappearing for days going on crack binges. When he did decide to come home, he was verbally and emotionally abusive to me. I finally had to begin taking medication myself just to get out of bed and go to work every day as a nurse because my anxiety was paralyzing. When I finally found the courage to ask him to leave, he came to my workplace and harassed me by driving in circles in the parking lot and revving his engine and the police had to be called. He told me that if I didn't deposit $5,000 into his bank account, he would come after me. So of course I did this. One week after he moved out, he came to my home late at night and tried to break in while I was home, all while yelling at me that he was going to get in and kill me. That's when I finally called the police. I was afraid of him and I still am. Alan never physically abused me, but he punched holes in doors, threw objects at me, and even whipped the belt at my head buckle in and got in my face, screaming at me and threatening me more times than I can count. I knew it was only a matter of time before the physical abuse happened. To say that I gave him thousands of dollars over a period of five years would be an understatement. He stole money from me for his drug use and he coerced me under duress to add his name onto the deed and mortgage of my house. Alan and his sister, are demanding money from me in order to get his name off of the deed. I've offered them a settlement, but they won't settle. 
I also have all of his property at my home. Is this his way of trying to still have some sort of control over me and have to deal with me when he is released? What kind of human being does this? I had to move out of my own home several times when Alan was on the run from the police during the summer of 2022, and I had a restraining order against him. My children really come to visit me because of fear. Uh, Alan yeah. even had the audacity to cut his ankle monitor off when he walked out of the courthouse and missed one of his hearings. He also threatened me in the courthouse another day. He walked out, got on his motorcycle, and left. Yet another time he was on the run. I knew that I had to escape his abuse, but I was afraid of him and the control that he had over me. He destroyed my self-worth and my self-esteem to the point that I actually began to believe the awful things that he was saying to me were true. I can go on and on about how Alan's abuse has affected my life, but the fact is that I'm trying to put it all behind me. I've been in therapy to deal with the PTSD that he caused. I am trying to move forward and rebuilding my life. I feel that the fact that the judge served Alan with a 25-year protective order for me speaks volumes, and Alan should not be released early from prison. I also believe that his criminal history should certainly be taken into consideration. I am sick thinking that he could be released in the next few months and have had many sleepless nights since being notified of this hearing. <clears throat> Alan apparently has done well while in prison, but that is only because he is in a lawful, controlled and locked environment. Alan does not know how to treat women and there will be another victim down the road. Sir, I, I apologize, Mrs. Mrs. Williams. Sir, you, please don't do that. That's very I, disrespectful. Please. Listen, that's disrespectful. I, listen. Go ahead, Mr. Williams, I apologize. Thank you. Alan does not know how to treat women and there will be another victim down the road, if not me again. He is a, he is a dangerous man and I will feel for my life whenever he is released. I ask that Alan is not released early from prison and that he serves the maximum time. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Thank you. I appreciate that impact from the victim. Um, you know, so, um, so at this time, Mr. Trivide, uh, we're going to discuss your request for discretionary parole. Please don't interrupt. Thank you. Um, so, uh, although Mr. Trivide, uh, says that he has changed uh, and I'm sure that he has in his his, his own head uh, but I don't see I don't know him personally so I cannot just take his word for uh, for it to his credit he did complete the domestic violence program um, he was not really able to share very much about what he learned but two things that I thought that were insightful was um, that he can't control anyone and that when he sees red flags, he should leave. Um, so I'm hoping that he's able to apply at least those two tools to his next relationship. Um, the, the cons for me are that at 55 years old, Mr. Trivide rates out very high. Uh, he's had, it looks like, 17 opportunities uh, for supervision out in the community, and he failed 13 of those. Um, he has not received any disciplinary infractions during this period of incarceration, so that does show some growth. However, uh, the fact that his responses to our questions yielded really no evidence of change. Um, and you couple that with his criminal history and his um, continued disregard for protective orders uh, with the injury and impact that the victim had shared with us through her statement that was read on the record. I could not support his request for discretionary parole. I would vote to deny his request with no new hearing date and um, set 
his special parole conditions. Oh, and I didn't even address his substance abuse problem that he says that he doesn't have, that he didn't take any full right into address. So for those reasons, um, I would deny. Mr. Rodriguez. Madam Chair, I would concur with uh, your assessment in this particular situation. Uh, as I shared with uh, Mr. Kavadi early, earlier, that I, you know, I didn't really hear anything that, for me, made him a suitable candidate for release today. Um, granted, he did take the domestic violence course, and I'm hoping that you know he'll be able to internalize some of the insights he got there and be able to utilize those things when he does get out and probably should continue to seek some of that um, advice and information when he does get out. And I'm sure we'll probably consider as part of a special parole uh, release, but uh, I, I'm just not um, there today to uh, support discretionary parole. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Ms. Summer. So I, I do agree with it, with everything that's been said by you, Madam Chair, and Mr. Rodriguez. Um, I, I do think it is um, worth mentioning that Ms. Mr. Tribade did have a, a pretty lengthy period of time uh, where he wasn't involved with the criminal justice system. So I find that encouraging in the sense that once he is back out, that may like special parole, that, that he can be successful. Mm -hmm. And he seems to have done that by avoiding alcohol and drugs. Um, he did get a letter of support from his sister, mm -hmm. um, which was in fire. It, yeah. He does have some support mm -hmm. in the community, I think, which is also um, a positive, a positive for him for when he is back, that he does have some family that he can lean on mm -hmm. um, as he reestablishes himself. But it is unfortunate. He did was able to identify some areas uh, through that he learned through the domestic violence program, mm -hmm. triggers, wait a minute, mm -hmm. but he was, he really did not present as, although he says he accepts responsibility, and, you know, we've read all the police reports, um, that he just can't seem to grasp the gravity of the situation. Um, and with his history, it's hard to even kind of say, well, we'll bring him back for right. another right. hearing, right. because he knows what he needs to be doing. It is just right. It seems he's making a conscious decision to do what he wants. I, I well, I, I think that he in his head that it's justifiable. Yes, it's my house. I think I should be able to get my things. We did this together, kind of thing. And I get it, but you know, he needs to really again sit down with someone and talk to them about the underlying stuff because he has to learn to let it go. Let go. Okay. okay. Anyway, and he needs to know what he needs to do in order to return with his belongings and how to live successfully. So that's our hope for him going forward. Exactly. Hopefully, he can prove us wrong on special parole. He did well last time I guess, under uh, supervision in the community, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that he can do it once more. All right. All right. So I have his criminal history as my reason for denial, a lack of program participation, inadequate evidence of offender change. Uh, the injury impact to the victim and or the victim's family as more reasons for denial for his conditions for uh, best parole. I have domestic violence, no contact with the victim. Um, I have all the yeah. halfway house um, just in case he needs it. He is self-sponsoring. We mm -hmm. did get that. And a mental health evaluation, maybe. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Anything else? Any other reasons for denial? No. All right. So, Mr. Trivedi, we're ready with our official decision with regard to Alan Trivedi, 156001. There's a motion to deny his request for discretionary parole based on his criminal history, the injury and impact to the victim and or the victim's family, his lack of program participation, and inadequate evidence of offender change. I further move to uh, set Mr. Trivedi's special parole conditions as he has six years of special parole to follow his sentence um, to which the following conditions will apply. Uh, actually, I want to also add a no consumption of alcohol. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, I just want the record to reflect that Mr. Trivedi has left the hearing room um, and also that he was very disrespectful when the victim's statement was being read. I will do that and as well. His conditions will be uh, no consumption of an alcoholic beverage, a mental health evaluation and treatment is deemed necessary, no contact with the victim, GM, domestic violence in the community, and also a halfway house if his uh, cell sponsor. Is there a second? 
Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. So uh, we'll go Thank you so much, sir. Will, will you just come in and take the microphone off? We pressed mute because he was interrupting. So they do it. Thank you, panel. Have a great weekend. Thank you. you. It's official. In Connecticut, I think that the lunatics run the asylum. I mean, he just Jedi mind tricked that CO to leave a parole hearing before it was over. And somehow he got him to open the door and escort him out. And it's like, even the parole board now, now in, in a sense, I, 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 I like the way the parole board handled it. But in another sense, I was like, no. I mean, they should have said something. They should have, you know, I mean, he did, she, they, she did snap at him when he started to laugh, but I just felt like another level of reprimand was called for. The guy is a giant baby. But wait till I share with you how long and scary his record is, because what Richard found is going to send shivers down your spine if it hasn't already from this hearing. This is man is dangerous it is unreal how he only received a four-year sentence because he has a record that dates back a couple of decades and yet the system is doing nothing to protect to protect his victims and it is terrifying before we go and let's see how long it takes for the ceo to figure out how to find the uh the unmute button you just come in and take the microphone off we pressed mute because he was interrupting so they do it thank you panel have a great weekend thank you, you. Well. so they do it you are still muted yeah. we're still muted for i'm sorry <laughs> What does he have to do, Kristen, to unmute it? It should be on the tablet itself. Oh, How's that? oh there we go. All right. Yep. Good morning, Eric. I will take Buckingham. You got it. Thank, Thank you. you. You got it. Eh, it's a. Uh, I don't know. Anyways. Let's go read this report because this is crazy when I saw this. This this is written recently, okay? This is written September 26, 2022. And there's something that I noticed on this that I think says it all, where a picture speaks a thousand words. This is the picture that speaks a thousand words. Do you see it? Made in china right i don't know if you can see my mouse right there made in china that's what this digital newspaper uses for their uh for their template image their stock photo handcuffs made in china and i think it's a perfect analogy for the system the correctional system in connecticut it's like a piece of fake plastic chinese made handcuffs. So Mr. Trivity was called into Superior Court for pretrial hearing on Monday and he didn't answer officials. And he didn't answer. Officials trace his whereabouts through GPS monitoring ordered as part of his release last month on more than $600,000 in bonds. The monitoring system zeroed in on him standing outside the courthouse. Despite urging by special public defender Robert F. Dyer to step inside, Trivity took a few more drags from his cigarette and left. And, like, I can just picture it. The big baby sitting there and then just stomping away, you know, his little tantrum. He knew he would be ordered to submit to narcotics tests, and he didn't want to do that, his attorney said. Violation of an order against using narcotics will likely have resulted in a bond increase. Wow. So uh, maybe take a narcotics test and get a bond increase or just run away. I mean, that's a really difficult decision to make for, you know, an average 50-year-old. 
Judge Jason Lobo was not amused, setting a bond at $1.25 million for his rearrest after he failed to appear by 4 p.m. I think that's fine. The judge even gave him up until 4 p.m., but whatever. The 54-year-old Trivity was repeatedly uh, has repeatedly violated police and court orders, spiraling further towards what Judge James Ginocchio warning warned in 2012 as becoming a very dangerous person and you know this is again what's scary it seems maybe that he's escalating as the years go on i don't know on august 12th when court officials noticed trivity riding his motorcycle listen to this they found him riding his motorcycle around the courthouse in torrington in violation of a protective order against a woman inside the courthouse. A police officer saw him, tried to stop him, and he said, nah, I'm good, and vroom, away. The big, giant baby. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that that, that instance wouldn't have even given him a massive sentence? He had cases pending for threatening to shoot police and a former girlfriend after the woman re rejected his sexual advances, advances. City police say the girlfriend was frantically seeking shelter in Trivity, from Trivity, who has an extensive criminal history, similar crimes against numerous victims. In 2012, he was sentenced to five years behind bars for violating a protective order, threatening and operating under the influence of narcotics or alcohol. He also received a five-year term in 2007 for DV and other crimes, telling the court he wanted to be a better person. By then, at age 38, listen to this, he had a rap sheet of 21 convictions dating back to the mid-1980s and a violation of every probation ever assigned to him. Let that sink in. And let it sink in that even up until now, a judge only gave him a four-year sentence. In 1999, he was convicted of repeatedly violating protective order and threatening to kill his wife with a knife. At the time, Trivity was working as a crane operator for a local scrap metal company. Following his arrest, he assaulted two officers. What a nice guy. Trivity's previous bond were posted, blah, blah, blah. And there's another article we'll, I will share with you. Um, let me first start to read it because it, it lists an address. It's an ancient address, but, you know, YouTube. So, cops, man-made bloody threat. I'm going to share the screen in a second. So, Alan Trivity, the big baby, was arrested Tuesday afternoon. And this was written in 2006, but it's still noteworthy to read. And thank you, Richard, for providing this info and catching this hearing and saying, Mandu, you got to cover this. So, <sighs> Trivity uh, arrested Tuesday afternoon by Torrington Police. Trivity is facing a spin cycle of criminal charges stemming from an August DV incident in which she was charged with second degree breach of peace, violating protective order and violating a protective order. Trivity was on probation at the time. Who would have thought? For DV, who would have thought? which spurred the Office of Adult Probation to charge him with four counts of violating probation. Also, when he failed to show up at Litchfield Superior Court Tuesday morning on the probation cases, he was charged with four charges of failure to appear in court. Assistant State Attorney Jonathan Knight, it's a cool name, Jonathan Knight, argued for a high bond, citing Trivity's criminal conduct and DV violence conviction since 1991 with the same victim. <sighs> Un, unreal array. Let me share the screen now. I can share it now. Yeah. The streets of Torrington will run red with her blood. Night read from Trivity's alleged threat to the 39 year old victim, according to police. This is not a teenager saying this. This is not a 20. This is a full grown man. I mean, man, baby. It's, uh, it's just crazy. 
Tripodi is on probation for conviction of interfering and resisting arrest, second degree breach of peace, violating protective order, said Francine Harrison, the court bail commissioner. He has numerous convictions and served time in jail for violating a protective order, violating probation, breach of peace, and third degree assault. Who's also sentenced to serve a year in jail for escape in 1991. This guy has an escape under his record. Trivity repeatedly violates court orders by having contact with the victim, Knight said. It's clear from Mr. Trivity's history and a matter before the court that he is unable to abide by the court orders and violating protective orders failing to appear in court. Remember, this was written in 2007. I mean, we fast forward like, what is it? I'm bad at math. 3, 10, 4, 14 years. <laughs> and it's the same thing. Shame on the DOs, shame on the, the Connecticut system, the judges and the DAs that are just completely incompetent. They're useless. The idea that this dangerous, dangerous, dangerous repeat offender can only have received a four-year sentence, can even show up and laugh as the victim talks at his parole hearing. And he's laughing because he's laughing at the system because he's getting out no matter what in his full term date, which is huh, 8 8 2026. That is two years and two months from the time of this recording. So he is laughing. And what do you think is going to happen? Do you, you know, what will happen? He's going to go and kill someone and everyone's going to say, oh, how did this happen? How did this happen? But we're all watching it happen. It's so clear to anyone without a PhD, without, you know, we're not lawyers, we're not judges, you know, we're not that smart, but, you know, we didn't go to Yale, but, you know, I don't know. Somehow it's clear to us that he's dangerous. I, I, I don't know how we figured it out. I mean, maybe it's his record that goes back 40 years. I don't know. I don't really know. But, uh, you know, what do we know? We're just sheeple. Just get in line and, you know, just be, we should just be good citizens. Knight warned that the state would seek enhanced penalties that could result in an additional 10 years if he is found guilty. Wow, I wonder why they didn't do that. Trivedi looked astonished when Knight quoted a remark about the victim's blood in the street and shook his head. His attorney, Larry Peck, told the court that the defense wanted to argue the bond when the case is heard against Litchfield Superior Court. Moreno imposed a total of $300,000 in bail bonds in the five cases and issued new protective orders prohibiting Trivedi from having contact with his child the victim and her mother the order is more severe it's more severe the judge said than the restraining order granted by judge wilson trombley in the civil court in july that he not harass or molest the victim for at least six months can you imagine that that's how tough the judge was six months you cannot do anything to the victim the victim told trombley that Trivity was violent towards her in the past, and she's fearful of what he might do. But don't worry. The judge said no contact for six months. The same fear allegedly prevented her from calling police when Trivity blocked her car into the parking lot. Um, her mother called the police about the incident and reported that Trivity was following the victim around town because she thought it was too scared to call police. Trivity allegedly threatened that if she got him arrested again, the streets of Torrington will run with her blood, and he was going to kill her children her mother, and her father, according to the arrest warrant. But don't worry, the judge said no contact for six months. So she's safe, obviously. You can't make this stuff up. You know, we saw the hearing. We saw him, this just man baby, um, which is what he is. He's a, a man baby. And, you know, Complete disrespect to the board, disrespect to the CO, disrespect to the victim, disrespect to the system. And really, he just seems to be getting away with it. Yeah, he was denied, but, he, you know, what do you think he's going to do for the next two years? But sit and stew and plan. I'm just speculating on a situation like this. As we know, I'm just a man, do. 
I have no idea. I don't have a PhD. I hope I'm wrong because it will be brutal. You know, it's interesting what they said in this hearing. The The world is watching. There's a lot of people. We don't know how many people are watching. Isn't that an interesting thing that they said? The first time I've really heard them say it to that extent. And I don't know how many people are watching until now. But now, yes, you're right. People are watching. People are. We are watching. And if he goes out and does something drastic and it makes the news and people are going to be like, how did this happen? And then they catch foot of this hearing. That's when things might start to change. That's when the sentences that are being dished out, it's really going to, there's really more context when you can actually see who you're dealing with. Anyways, with that, I'll let you go.